follower. This is cienciaperu.tv in our section, English conversation with the scientists. We are very interested to know the story of scientists, how they began in the little school, the middle school and the university. How they got this interest in science. This opportunity, we are the pleasure to talk with uh, Dr. Patrick Talou from France, but now he is working in the United States. Uh, we are very interested to know his story. Good evening, uh, Patrick. How are you? Good evening. Very well. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, where uh, did you born exactly? In, in which uh, city? So, so I was born uh, near Paris in, in France, um, long time ago now. <laughs> and, um, but then I, I didn't really stay in Paris. I uh, moved when I was about three years old uh, near Bordeaux, uh, which is in the south of France. Near Bordeaux. And uh, this um, city is very known in the world because of wine. And do you That's like? Right. Do you like wine? Of course. I, I do like wine. Uh, it took me a while, but I do like wine now. <laughs> and with the, uh, uh, what IH age you began to drink? Oh, um, you know, in France, they will, they will, parents and friends will offer you some, some wine pretty young. Uh, but but at, usually when you are young, you actually not, you don't like it too much. Um, so I didn't like wine until I was, I don't know, maybe 20. Uh, so it took, it took me a while to, to get used to it. And now I really like it. <laughs> you know, uh, when I was a baby, um, I was living between women and wine. Baby, drinking wine. Okay. Myself. Huh? That's a, that's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> the problem was with my mom, um, she had problems. And uh, she um, gave my, uh, to my, uh, their sisters to care for me. Mm. And, and uh, it seems to be that it was, I was all the time crying, crying, crying. And they discovered that wine helped me. <laughs> so, so three, three women, huh? <laughs> me with wine. So you know, I became very young. Huh? Mm. So, in which school, little school, you started your education? So I, um, I attended um, elementary school and junior high school and high schools that were very close to my, uh, to my place where I was living. Uh, and it's, uh, it was a small village near, uh, near Bordeaux. Uh, the high school was, was in Bordeaux, um, but it's all public schools. And uh, it was a pretty, pretty good time. It was a nice, um, you know, average school, but, but pretty good. And uh, your uh, interest in science, how it began? When it began, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I think I was always interested in, in kind of, I, I was always curious, let's put it this way. I think curiosity is maybe the, the main trait of, of scientists also is you have to be curious with, with the world around you and try to understand it. And science is just one way of trying to understand it. But um, I had one, one event in my, in my youth that really started my interest in astrophysics, in particular, astronomy, was... Um, the colony for vacation, huh? What's that? You say colony? No, no. I, 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 um, I said there was a one, one event, one particular event in my, in my life where... I was really uh, struck by the beauty of the sky, the night sky, and I got fascinated by, by stars and astronomy and uh, started really pouring into books of, you know, 
uh, way beyond my age. Uh, at least that's what I was told and uh, started being interested in quantum physics. So this was maybe when I was 10 years old. Uh, yeah, 10 years old actually. And then uh, I got really interested in physics in general and, and quantum physics always fascinated me uh, since I was, I don't know, maybe 14. Huh? Do you remember uh, the, how do you say this, the best teacher in your school or high school? Yes, I had I had one teacher. I mean, it's always the case that you have some good teachers, some bad teachers, but um, a good teacher can make a, a big difference in your life. Uh, I remember one event in particular in high school. It was not a physics teacher; it was a math teacher um, who uh, who forced me to and who forced the class to learn by heart some. Um, some trigonometric relations, you know, the cosine signs. Um, and, and I saw that by the time of high school, I was, you know, too smart for that. I, I, want, I didn't want to learn anything by heart. I wanted to understand uh, what was behind the logic, the theorems. Uh, and I was, I was really uh, dumbfounded. I, I thought, no, I'm, I'm not going to learn by heart. And he was really, you know, strong will and said, no, no, you are going to learn by, by heart these things because it has to become a second nature. Uh, it has to be something that you don't have to think about. Uh, when you see any equations and you are going to just feel it and you are going to see what's behind, not by, you know, uh, if you didn't know the equations very well, then you wouldn't have this second feeling, this uh, sixth sense in a sense that, you know, it's going to come to you. And he was absolutely right. I think you really develop this kind of, it's like when, when you want to express yourself, you don't want to know how to spell something or try to find the word. Even if you know it, even if you know the word and you have to look in the dictionary, that's not going to be helpful. So you have to go beyond the, uh, barely, uh, barely knowing something. You have to know it really in, in your, as a second nature. And uh, why nuclear physicist? Because you are a nuclear physicist. Well, this is, um, yeah, I evolved in this. I mean, I don't think, well, I don't know, maybe there are some people who are really interested in, in a particular uh, aspect of, of science or physics very, uh, very early on. For me, that was astronomy. And so astronomy led me to continue my studies after high school, uh, going into physics. And I realized that to do some proper astrophysics, you need to know physics and physics and in particular nuclear physics. So I started going into that direction. Maybe early on was more on quantum physics. I was still fascinated by that. And um, so I was very attracted to the quantum, quantum physics part of things. And eventually I ended up in a, in a nuclear physics lab where I did my PhD, but it was still a lot of quantum physics that I was doing. Oh, I cannot hear you. Hola, hola. Oh, here, yeah. yes. Okay. Okay, so nuclear physicists in, in France is, um, I, I think, um, not so problematic as in Germany. You know, in Germany, uh, nuclear physicists not uh, very loved by, by young people at your, at your times. There's, there's um, quite a lot of nuclear physics in Germany as well in terms of research um, and, and really good one, GSI and, and some other institutes. But um, uh, yeah, in Germany, it's much more problematic in terms of nuclear energy. Uh, Germany has kind of pushed away from nuclear uh, the nuclear energy production, but at the same time, they use a lot of nuclear energy from from other countries like France, which you know eighty percent is nuclear energy. So, uh, so they they have a very good uh, nuclear physicist, but uh, they don't like nuclear energy. Yeah, I think I don't know. I think it's misinformation. Really, uh, there has been a campaign against nuclear energy. Uh, for good or bad reasons. I mean, we can discuss that a lot. Um, I think it's still one of the energies that is going to save us from a lot of climate change. Uh, not every country can count on solar or wind or hydropower. 
Uh, and so you need to have a base load of um, energy that is really stable and low emitting um, of carbon, and that's that's nuclear. So I'm a very strong proponent of nuclear energy, and uh, a lot of the the fight that has been going on between uh, you know the environmentalists on one hand and uh, and the nuclear industry on the other hand has to stop. I mean we. We have to come to an agreement that it's part of the portfolio. Uh, it has produced a lot of energy, a lot of electricity for generations without any problem. There has been some accidents, uh, but at the same time, when you look at the track record, uh, it's actually pretty impressive compared to other source of energy. So this year, uh, I know that uh, several reactor, nuclear reactors in France uh, were not working. They, have, they got problem. What was the problem for this reactor? So, I mean, reactors in general, they, they follow a very strict sec, uh, safety and security uh, guidelines, right? So they are monitored very, very carefully as, as they should be. Um, so sometimes when, uh, when an incident occurs, it's often not very, uh, you know, threatening or in any sense very dangerous, but it has to be taken care of and it is taken care of seriously. Um, and, and so this is what happens. Some of the, um, some of the power plants have been aging uh, much more gracefully than, than we thought because they were not supposed to be, you know, they had a particular lifetime that were supposed to be operating for a certain time. And uh, in fact, they have all been extended. Um, but it's something that you have to take, you know, very, very seriously. So if there is an incident of any kind, you need to just pause, stop and, and look at it and, and uh, fix the problem. But in terms of uh, the production, I know, the, I know better the numbers in, in the US versus France right now, because um, I've been living here for a long time. Um, the, the, the production rate of the, of the power plants, the nuclear power plants in the US have never been so high. So it means they are functioning at a, at a very unprecedented um, rate without any problem and producing a lot of clean energy. So we, we need that. Uh, there is a lot of talks now about the small and modular reactors, SMRs, the renaissance of nuclear energy. Uh, but in many countries, that's the only way. France is one place where there's not much natural resources. Um, so if you want to have clean energy, you have to go through nuclear, not too many options. Of course. <laughs> Your field of research is uh, just neutronic. Neutrons are a key for a nuclear reaction, <laughs> no? Uh, my field of research is, is nuclear reaction mechanisms uh, in general. So it's not just neutrons. It can be photons, it can be protons, it can be any cluster or any, any bigger particles, uh, but neutrons, are a big deal. Yes, they, they play a big role in our in our applications, uh, and so yeah, that's something that I kind of specialize. My my specialty really is nuclear fission. I, I really have devoted a lot of time on on this study. You wrote a book about that. Huh? Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what is the subject in your the main subject in your book? Why you why people must book must uh, uh, buy this this book <laughs> so this, this book uh, came out of um, uh, the realization that I, so I, I created uh, I started a, a school uh, on nuclear fission a summer school and uh, it was a combination of summer school and and workshop uh, the summer school really intended for people with uh, either graduate students, maybe undergraduate students, postdoc, uh, more senior scientists interested in the field. So it, it covered a kind of a broad range, but you needed, you know, to have a, a fundamentals in, in physics and in nuclear physics. Um, but so we, we did this, uh, this school several times and invited different lecturers, um, really uh, renowned scientists in, in their field on the topic of nuclear fission, which is a, it's a big deal in, in Los Alamos where I work, and it's a big deal for all nuclear energy power plants, and it's a big deal in, in many, many applications of, of uh, space reactors and others. 
Um, so I wanted to provide a, a venue for educating the next generation and bringing people to really uh, learn this fascinating topic, because in my mind, that's really a, a topic of great interest from very academic uh, interest, fundamental scientific research, all the way to many applications um, which are essential in our, in our lives of uh, everyday life, even if we don't realize it. Uh, nuclear energy is just one of them. So I created this school and um, after a couple of editions, I got approached by some people from some um, editors and uh, suggested that is there a material for having some having a book there? And uh, I said, well, maybe. And so I, um, you know, I put together a, a proposal to write a book. It was reviewed by several um, anonymous reviewers, and it was accepted. So uh, then I embarked on this project, crazy project, to write this book. Uh, I'm not the only one. I, it's a, it's an edited volume. And I had a, a co-editor, Ramona Vogt, uh, with, uh, from Livermore and uh, UC, uh, UC Davis. Uh, and there are about 10 or 11 uh, co-authors in this, in this book. And it really treats a lot of topics under nuclear fission. Uh, it's, it's a very broad topic. And we try to mix theory, experiments, and the application side of the different topics. So there's cross sections, of course, that are very important, just the probability of fission reaction occurring. Uh, there is um, the distribution of the fragments when fission occurs. How, what are those nuclei? What are their characteristics, their chemical characteristics, but also are they going to emit more neutrons, more photons? How do they behave? How much energy do they, do they release? All of these things. Uh, all of these questions are very important. We could say that they have been, you know, studied since, you know, the 1938, the, the year of the discovery of fission. Uh, but we still have a lot of uh, of um, laps and gaps in our knowledge. So uh, it's a fascinating topic. It's quantum many body problems. So from a fundamental point of view, it has not been solved. Um, and so it's really um, pushing our our super computers and our super scientists to really try to understand it and uh, scratch their head and keep looking at it. Uh, and on the application side, we need better and better data because we want to do these, you know, reactors, new reactor designs. Um, we want to make sure that uh, it's safer, it's uh, more productive, and we can have new applications. Uh, so it's, it's really an important topic. And there is a competition between United States and France. Uh, in fact, this project, the ITER, is in Kadarash and United States. How is running this competition? And the two methods, two techniques to produce fusion. So, so yeah, ITER is about fusion, not fission. Uh, it's really okay. about, yes. Uh, and I don't know if, I mean, yes, there is a bit of competition in terms of uh, the two technologies that are at play, is, uh, inertial confinement with lasers, uh, and then the tokamak, uh, which is really the, the option chosen by, by ITER. But ITER is a very international collaboration. Uh, the US is actually part of the collaboration. And so uh, I don't think in that sense there is any, any competition. And ITER is much more about the production of energy that's the ultimate goal of, of the ITER project. While uh, you could look at the NIF project, which is at, at Livermore National Lab, the National Ignition Facility. And uh, their primary role is not really to produce energy. Uh, their primary role is to understand the nuclear fusion that occur uh, in the condition of a nuclear weapon or in, you know, in stars. So it's, um, it's a different, um, it's a different goal at the beginning. You could imagine NIF going into something that resembles the energy production, but it's a, it's a big stretch. It's not going to be easy. Oops, I don't hear you again. Hola. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, so, 
At the beginning of this year, I know you were uh, to France. You go to, uh, because uh, co collaboration, cooperation in, in uh, science, what kind of co cooperation there is between your lab in United States and your uh, university, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, we, we collaborate across the world. Uh, we really have really good collaborators in France, that's true. Uh, but also in places like Italy, uh, places like uh, Germany, Japan, uh, Korea. We, we are pretty much collaborating all across the world, and uh, which is a really nice aspect of uh, scientific work, right? We, we don't really have any boundaries, and we have a good idea and uh, has some ways to, to communicate. And now communication happens much more often with uh, Zoom or uh, uh, you know, online, and it's um, it's no problem to do this type of, of collaboration. I have participated in this uh, last uh, uh, big meeting on fusion organized by the Agency of uh, Vienna in '79. It was the fourth symposium, but there is no more a symposium organized by uh, this agency. And nevertheless, there are several, several uh, meetings of fishing in the world. Huh? Yeah, we, we actually work with, uh, with the IEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency in, in Vienna. Uh, we, uh, we tend to have collaboration research projects. So it's very technical, specific projects on particular aspects of, of interest that is of interest to the world. And um, so we do collaborate on, on fission and a particular aspects of fission. And the latest one that I personally participated in was in 2016 uh, on knowing the energy spectrum of these neutrons that are coming out with, with fission. And their precise, accurate measurement and knowledge is extremely important for many applications. So uh, there were people all around the, all around the world who met um, and try to get their best estimate of what, it, what this is. There is a new effort now on even cross sections that again we uh, have been studied since the beginning of um, times in terms of fission times. What, what we since the discovery of fission, but we still need to know this quantity very very accurately. So and it's a complicated problem. It's a very difficult theoretical problem. It's very difficult to get down to very accurate sub percent type of measurements. Uh, so there is a lot of money, a lot of efforts that are being poured into knowing these things better. There are many theories about the, the process of fission. Um, very complicated theories, a, a question, a question, a more equation, but uh, seems to be that is not completely solved to, to calculate the distribution of fragments, kinetic energies, spin, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, how do you think about this uh, little chaos? Huh? <laughs> I, I think that's a very, it's a fascinating problem. Uh, and it's a very complicated problem compared to, uh, to may, many other scientific questions. And the reason is, is twofold. One is that it's, uh, it's a quantum problem. It's, you know, classically, you cannot really solve it. You have to go to the quantum physics. Uh, second, it's a many body problem. Uh, if you look at the nucleons, so the neutron and protons as uh, constituents of the nucleus, um, and if you take uh, an actinide, uh, typically you will have 240 of those, of those nucleons, you know, fighting with each other or, or interacting with each other. Uh, trying to follow these degrees of freedom and how they interact in a dynamical process uh, on, at a quantum level. And on top of that, uh, the thing that distinguishes nuclear from any other field is really that we don't know the nuclear forces to an infinite precision, right? It's not like uh, atomic physics where we know the atomic forces. We know the interactions very, very well. We know the electromagnetic interactions. Nuclear forces, we know only in an approximate way. So we try to develop some effective theories that are telling us what are the interactions of these nucleons. And the interactions between the nucleons is not the same if they are just you know, two neutrons together, or if there are two neutrons coming with a surrounding of 
their brothers and sisters there, right? So it's it gets more complicated because it's not just a single particle uh, problem. It becomes this, this collective problem. So there are two main approaches, I would say, two main theoretical venues to, uh, to address this. One is to look at these nucleons in their elementary form. So, I mean, we are not going to the quarks. Also, to some extent, we are doing this with the effective theory. But let's start with the nucleons, and you try to follow all these particles together. And you try to follow the 240 uh, nucleons interacting at a given time with each other. Uh, with two body forces, three body forces, and beyond. So it, it gets pretty complicated. And it requires, if you want to solve this problem dynamically uh, with realistic forces, you need supercomputers. And we do some of these calculations in Los Alamos. Uh, in France, there are some, some people at CEA who do this type of calculations as well. Um, and in, in at Livermore and, and a few other places where uh, we can carry this type of calculation. But it's, it's very complex. And the second venue for, for fission in particular is to say, forget about the individual components, at least at first. Let's say this is a liquid drop. This is kind of a, it's not quite a liquid drop. It's not quite a, a, a drop of water. It's a quantum liquid drop. So there are some quantum effects still. But basically, it's just a quantum liquid drop that is going to deform and, and eventually split into two or more particles. But it simplifies the problems a lot because now you have only a few degrees of freedom to, to, um, to understand and characterize this, this droplet. And so you can see that in the, this macroscopic way, uh, classical way of thinking of this, plus some quantum corrections that are very important to really understand and really appreciate the, all the data. But you can start from this more global macroscopic view of, of the nucleus as opposed to going down to all the microscopic ones. Uh, and these two competing, I would say, it's not necessarily competing, but it's two alternative approaches, two alternative models of the nucleus uh, can help each other. Uh, one is simpler conceptually for our brains that is more used to the classical world. Um, and it's more amenable to computers because I mean, we, it's, it's, we can run many more calculations with a simplified problem than rather than you know very complex microscopic calculations that sometimes the degrees of freedom are so complex you you get a result and you don't really know why you got the result so uh, it's good to see those two advancing and we have made a lot of progress in the last 10 20 years and we'll see where it leads but also the experimental uh, equipment the setup experimental setup are also very different. There are several complicated things. For example, in Grenoble, there is the Lohengrin. It is an spectrometer. This uh, spectrometer detects one fragment, but um, there are other setups more uh, small, smaller, and they detect the two fragments to find complementary results, um, we need uh, maybe also other, other kind of experiment to, to complete the data, you know, because uh, we have no one solution for these uh, two kind of experiments. Huh? Yes, uh, some people have dreamed of the, the coffee experiment, the complete fission experiment. And uh, which you know would, would basically measure everything that comes with a fission event. So you have two fragments, you want to know their energies, you want to know their mass, their charges, um, you want to know the direction where they are going, and you want to know all the characteristics of all the neutrons and photons that are coming out at the same time, right? So that would be in, in, not only in their numbers, but also their energy, their angle, everything. Okay, that would be this coffee experiment, the complete fission experiment. And it sounds wonderful. Um, and fortunately, it's nearly impossible. Uh, and the reason is the following. If you want to know very, very precisely, for instance, let's say the neutrons coming out, you want to know their number. Well, if you want to know their number, you want to be very, very close to the target. You want just to capture all the neutrons coming out 
and you don't want to let any of the neutrons coming out. So you you, you capture them all, uh, and you can you count right. You you count their numbers, uh, and hopefully you can count while detecting a fission event. So you know okay they are associated with one particular event, and that will is going to give you the multiplicity or the the, not, the probability of emitting those neutrons. Uh, that's great. But if you do that, you lose all information about their energy. You just capture them. You know that there was a neutron, but you don't know their energy. It's just captured. If you want to know their energy very precisely, especially for the fast neutrons that come out very, very quickly, you want to be far away from the target or from, from the fissioning uh, or from the fission reaction. So because you want to put some distance and you want to you can get to the energy by just measuring the time it takes for a neutron to go from the target to the detector. And if you do that, you have a time of flight and you mm -hmm. can just you know, divide the, the distance by the time it takes and you get the velocity of um, and the energy. If you, if you are smart enough, you, you can get the energy and the velocity of these neutrons. But if you do that, you need to be far. Uh, if you are too close, you are not going to capture all these neutrons. Some of them are going too fast, and your detector is going to be blind. So you need to, to be further away and measure those very fast ones. Uh, it means if you wanted to capture them all, you would need this 4 pi array uh, completely covering the entire, um, you know, the entire angle, the coverage of, uh, of all those reactions. So, and you would want them very precisely, very small detectors, so that you could really know in which direction they are going. So, you have basically competing metrics, and, and it's very, very hard to get every inform, all the information together. Um, and sometimes it's actually counterproductive to think this way. That uh, it's good sometimes. You want some correlations. You want some information. Uh, you know how many neutrons if you have this particular fragment. So, correlations are very important. But if you want everything, sometimes it's much better to get a dedicated experiment to get to the information you want. And then you go to the theory and the models to, to make sense of this whole body of data, even if they are not in the same experiment. You are trying to piece together this puzzle and reconstruct what it means to have a fission event. Yes, it's very complicated. As you know, this. Um experiment in CERN about the Higgs boson. No, there are many, many detectors and uh, very complicated things, but it costs a lot of money. <laughs> Maybe uh, we need to, to do something similar for to study this fission. Eh? <laughs> so it, it, it's great you are bringing this example because uh, what happens at, at CERN for, for looking for this uh, Higgs boson and others is, this is a time projection chamber, right? So where they try to, you see this trajectory, this uh, emitted particles each time there is a, a reaction and you can reconstruct the trajectories. That's exactly what is being done now uh, at Livermore and Los Alamos with what we call the fission TPC, time projection chamber. And the idea is just exactly that to reconstruct a particular trajectory in space in three dimensions of a particular fission event. And if you combine that with some detectors of neutrons and gammas, you get closer to this complete experiment, coffee experiment, or uh, at least you can study some correlations and clean up your signal. And, and, but that's exactly what's being done um, to, at least at first, the, the, the goal was to get a, a fission cross-section at a sub-percent level. So if you go to lower than 1% accuracy for this type of things, it's very, very hard. Because you want to have it as a function of the neutron energy coming in and creating the fission, so it, it gets it gets pretty complicated. It gets um, any source of error has to be really tackled very carefully. Uh, but that's that's pretty much what they are doing: fission, uh, a TPC, same as um, high energy physics. Yeah. Well. Okay. And uh, I know that French people. Doesn't like don't like uh, to to go out. Well, they love his country. How did you decided to to go to United States? It was uh, difficult. Yeah. So I guess uh, when I was doing my my PhD, 
uh, I was um, my my PhD advisor collaborated with uh, scientists at Los Alamos, and so I got an opportunity to come here. Uh, I went first to Berkeley actually uh, for for a month, and then I came to Los Alamos for a month. Uh, and then another six months because um, said how oh, I could do some work there and they wanted me there. So, and then I, I kept coming back. Um, and uh, eventually I met my future wife here. So uh, <laughs> American. So that's the way I, you know, ended up staying <laughs> in the US. <laughs> oh, that's explaining everything, huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> but then, but then I also got a job, uh, a permanent job in uh, at Los Alamos, and it was, uh, you know, a pretty in, fantastic opportunity. In Berkeley, you have been in this uh, national laboratory in Berkeley. Uh, yes, it was uh, it was a national laboratory. Yes, up the hill. Uh, yes, in the hills. Huh? Yeah, there is a, a beautiful place. Uh, yeah. There is, a, I know the, the I I have been there. There is an accelerator, but a reactor? There is no reactor, or yes? There is a reactor? No, no. I mean, I was uh, I was working in a theory group uh, with uh -huh. Dr. Rundrup, and okay. uh, we still collaborate with now, actually. That's interesting. We get full circle. Um, and uh, yeah, so I was I was mainly there uh, as a theory and modeling and uh, doing some simulations. But um, I'm not an experimentalist. I, I work with experimentalists. I didn't get an opportunity to. Well, I got an, oppor an interesting opportunity there when I was. Uh, so it was it was during my PhD, and one event that I remember pretty well is uh, there was Gamma Sphere. Uh, the inauguration of Gamma Sphere was there, and uh, it was fantastic because the way they were doing this, they were putting the chairs. Um, uh, so it, there was an audience and there were nine chairs right much closer to, to the rest uh, than the rest of the audience. And it was for all the Nobel Prizes that Berkeley has would be sitting <laughs> there. Um, some of them I, had passed. I, by remember, that time, so. I remember, I remember in the, uh, in the, how do you say it? The auto park, the park uh, to cars. Mm -hmm. I have been there. It's, T. Sibor, Nobel Prize. <laughs> That's right. So, I, I, yeah, I crossed Seaborg there. Uh, I was still alive at the time. And uh, ah. that was kind of a, a nice, uh, yeah, nice memory. I think for me, uh, Berkeley is a very, I, the nicest place to work. It's very intellectual, eh? Berkeley. It is, it is. I mean, I, I, must, I must say that uh, Los Alamos is also a pretty incredible place to work. Um, it's, but it, uh, it's, it seems to be very isolated, Los Alamos. By design, yes. Um, uh, historically, designed to be isolated, but but it has changed a lot since the uh, you know since the war time and the sixties, where it was still a secret city. Uh, now it's it's you know it's very open. There are still, of course, some you know classified work and secret work that is happening, but a lot of it is is really open. Uh, it's a beautiful. Mesas in the Rockies of um, uh, of the U.S. and it's uh, it's a beautiful location. So, and, and the intellectual uh, demands there, also intellectual, um, um, I will say, um, interest is is really high. There are some really really uh, strong people. And you are close to Santa Fe, a very nice city. Eh? I live in Santa Fe. Uh, uh, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I live in Santa Fe and commute to uh, to Los Alamos. Do uh, you know my name, Montoya? There is in several places Santa Fe. <laughs> it's a know. very common name around here. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Even Modesto is common there. So I remember when I had been there, somebody said Modesto Montoya. It's, it's, it's not, was it not, was not you. <laughs> <laughs> the post office, post office Joseph Montoya. And so, yeah. and so, there is a, a, a village, Montoya. In, in, it's close to Albuquerque. Albuquerque in, and there is a, this, um, how do you call this? Called Fiji, this, uh, this competition of uh, balloons. Oh, yes, yeah, the balloon fiesta. Yeah. Balloon fiesta. Do you like that? Yeah, I mean, it's beautiful to see that. I, I went a couple of times. Oh, to, uh, people from everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's a competition very famous, huh? 
It's a competition. It's an exhibition. Also, it's uh, it has some crazy balloons. And when you see, you know, uh, I don't know many hundreds of balloons in the air. It's pretty fantastic. It's pretty amazing to see that. That uh, you didn't do that. I went. Uh, I went into a balloon, but not here. I went to a balloon in France, actually, and it was not the best experience for me. So I don't know. Um, felt the heat. You know, you, you're close to the. Um, to the flames, and I, I don't know. I didn't. Uh, I enjoy watching them. Uh, I don't necessarily enjoy being in one of them. So, have you spent some time uh, in uh, Grenoble in ILL? No, I I went. I passed by them, but I didn't really stay uh, any time. You know, I I did, I had a few opportunities during my PhD, but after that, I um, I really spend much, much more time in the US. Um, and although we collaborate and I used to come back uh, to France. It's more, maybe it's more experimentalist, huh? more experiment there. In Grenoble, yes, yes. But, um, but I know some people very well there. Um, so one of, one of my uh, lecturers for the first school that I, that I set up was uh, Dr. Gonan Vine. Uh, <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. by, and he's a fantastic lecturer. I think uh, a very fascinating speaker. And so it was it was a pleasure to have him uh, there. I had a great conversation with him. Uh, yes, he is very famous in fiction, um, and he is, I think, in in uh, Gottingen or something. Uh, Tübingen. Um, ah, see. Yeah. He's still working. Do you know something about him? I haven't heard from him for a long time. Um, so the, the edition where I was talking about it was 2014. I think I've lost track of him in yeah five, six years ago. So I don't know. I don't know. I believe he retired, but um, I don't have any news. Another place for you is uh, Orsay. Tell me mm -hmm. something about Orsay. How do you how do you think of it? It's a nice place. Uh, nature, river, everything. Yeah, so I spent uh, some of my studies in Orsay, so it's the south of Paris, and uh, it's a nice campus here for sure. Uh, uh, it's it was a nice. Uh, I, I really enjoyed my studies there, and uh, I, I did my physics uh, undergrad studies there, and I, I really enjoyed. It. I, had a, I have some friends actually from from college from that time that I'm going to meet again in in July. Um, so that I haven't seen sometimes in for 20 years. So it's going to be fun. And some people still work as professors now in Orsay. And in Germany, which city do you know by your work? Um, so I, I know quite a few. I don't know. I mean, I, I know people from GSI. I know um, uh, Karin Schmidt, for instance. Maybe uh, you've heard of him. And uh, we've had several conversations because uh, Gunn and Vine, I mean, he's, he's one of them that I've, I've been... Uh, really discussing a lot. Um, I know people also in Belgium maybe have more interactions there at the uh, GRC in, in Hell. Um, you know, there was uh, Dr. Hamsch. Uh, he retired now, but uh, he was kind of a, a big figure in fission experiments. He's doing a lot of these. Uh, and um, I don't know. Um, that's... I, I, the people I work most with now, I would say, are in CA in France. Um, some of them are in in uh, Bruyere Chatel in Paris, near Paris. Some of them are in Cadarache, um, so where Eater is, or just beside. Um, so I work with a fair amount of people there. I have some collaborators in Bordeaux still, uh, and then pretty much everywhere, like in, in Vienna, I was telling you in um, in Austria. Uh, I some of my collaborators here. I brought them from. I mean, Los Alamos. I brought them from from Austria, uh, from France, from Japan. So uh, we have collaboration in Japan as well, more than Germany, I would say. Yeah. Going out of fission, um, this year the Nobel Prize of this year is what's so the French? Are you proud or? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well. Uh, in Orsay, he worked in Orsay, very famous. Do you know him? Alain Aspect, yeah. So, <laughs> um, it's, he's funny, eh? 
Yeah, yeah, he's a, he's a very, very funny guy. I, I, um, I don't know him personally, uh, but I, uh, I remember attending a couple of his talks. Uh, one time it was in France, and one time was in Los Alamos, where he came uh, to give a, a talk. It was before he got the Nobel Prize, uh, but not that much earlier. And um, he was much funnier in, in France because he was speaking French and uh, <laughs> he had some of these jokes. And uh, he, he, was, he was a really, really good, uh, really good speaker. Um, and he's, yeah, it's, uh, it's fantastic. At the same time, um, well, yes, it, it's fantastic for, for France and it's hopefully gives some, uh, some boost to the scientific education and inspiration for young people to get into this field. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot of questions with education in, I would say everywhere, but in France in particular, you know, what's, uh, what's happening? Is it the best way to uh, educate and teach uh, kids uh, those days? I have my own ideas about this, and uh, that's one thing that I'm going to tackle in my next life, next phase of my life. Um, but so it's, it's always nice to see some very high scientific uh, scientists, you know, very, very smart scientists to be re rewarded. It's a school, really. I mean, uh, there, was, there were several people in the, that school who got the Nobel Prize for similar things in quantum optics in particular. Okay, uh, Patrick, um, this program is, um, organizes, it pretends to convince young people in Peru to study English. I don't speak English because uh, all men at that, at that time, <laughs> we don't need it too much. But now it's necessary to speak uh, English, to go in, you, you, you know, Korea, Germany, everywhere you speak English. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, at the beginning, have you had some trouble to speak uh, in English? Because French, uh, I know, uh, I remember, do you remember Mitterrand? Mitterrand? Mitterrand, I, I, I remember in the conference, there was a colleague from, from Orsay. He said, um, well, our president uh, gave a, an order in international conference, this French scientist must speak in French. <laughs> and uh, he said, I am going to obey a uh, half. I'm going to speak a uh, bad English <laughs> <laughs> at that time. But, but now people speak English, uh, necessary to speak. How do you, how can you uh, uh, explain to young people the necessity to speak in English? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's mandatory. I mean, if you don't speak English, it's very, very hard to communicate uh, with the rest of the community. It's very hard to get in touch with the right people. Uh, but also don't be scared. I mean, I, I mean, my accent remains, you know, after 20 plus years spent in the US, my accent has not changed. Uh, there's nothing I can do. But at least my English and my vocabulary and my my ability to write and, and speak uh, is, is much, much better. But at the beginning, you know, you, you, you try your best, um, you make some mistakes and it's okay. Uh, there are a lot of people, a lot of foreigners um, in, uh, in Los Alamos who, who come and work here and in any university settings. I mean, you have people from all around the world and that's very, very rich. Uh, but you need to have a common language. And it's very hard if you know, you know more than three or four languages that you are going to be the exception, that's great. But uh, you're, it's going to limit your, you know, I mean, if you do that, that's great. But if you are the one on the receiving end and you know only one language, it's tricky. So learning English is, is mandatory. I mean, you, you just force yeah. yourself to read. The first thing I, I did when I came to the US is take a book, a big book and read and try to understand every single word in it. And, you know, at first I was going page by page with a dictionary on the side and every day I was doing one page. And, you know, after a few, few uh, days, you go to, you know, maybe two pages, three pages at a time. That's fantastic. And then you keep going and keep going. And I don't know how long it took me for finishing this book, but um, 
um, it was 100 years of solitude. Actually, I remember even the, <laughs> which is not English native. I mean, it's Spanish, <laughs> but um, but it's a fantastic book. And but that's how I really pushed myself to learn. And you need to do that in in science, but but not just in science. In anything, uh, it really opens doors, and it's so important nowadays. Now maybe you know the AI is going to replace that, and it's going to be so easy to to talk in any language, but. Do, do you speak to your, do you have a children? I have two children, yes. Do you speak to them in French, I, I suppose? Well, it, it depends. Uh, you know, they have lived all their lives in, in the US. Uh, and sometimes, so they speak French fluently. There is a, they are bilingual and that's, that's fantastic. Uh, but there are times where it's easier to speak English and there are times where it's easier to speak French, depending on where we are, depending on, uh, so. Um, because I, I read that, uh, I think it's uh, Pauli or some great scientist at the age of uh, 16, uh, when talking to women speaking French and to men in English because his father all the time speaking English and the mother in French. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> he was convinced that uh, women speak French and men English, you know. <laughs> I so didn't you... know that. It's interesting. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. It was nice to talk with you and uh, as uh, my, my followers, my young followers, I think uh, must be convinced now that they had, they had to, to speak in English. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank Patrick. you. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. Hasta el encuentro científico siguiente.